Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and the elders of other communities that might be here. So it's an, an enormous personal um, pleasure for me to welcome Professor Jonathan Sabon to give today's postgraduate lecture. Um, Jonathan is a physician scientist at Australia's newest medical research institute, the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Research Institute in Heidelberg, where he heads the uh, Cancer Immunobiology Laboratory. Uh, Jonathan is also the medical director of the Cancer and Neurosciences uh, Clinical Services Unit at Austin Health, and he's a professor at Melbourne and La Trobe Universities. So Jonathan um, spent almost his entire career being associated with the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research. Um, he undertook his uh, PhD studies with George Morstan. Actually, he's just told me he's the only um, PhD student that George had that went from beginning to end. Um, and at that time, they were um, participating in uh, the very exciting studies, um, research and clinical trial studies to bring uh, GMCSF into cancer treatment. And then after a, a period uh, overseas, he went uh, to the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle, Washington, um, prior to coming back to Melbourne, first to the Royal Melbourne and the Ludwig, but then um, for the last 20 so years, um, he's been at the Austin campus. Um, so he was um, uh, head of the um, um, Austin branch of the Ludwig Institute when it was succeeded by the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Research Institute at the beginning of this year. So Jonathan's research interests are in malignant melanoma, um, human uh, immune responses to cancer and cancer therapeutics. And so like uh, Mark Smith, a couple of weeks ago, um, he's obviously delighted to be able to uh, talk about the transformative effect that immunotherapy um, has uh, recently had on cancer medicine, and his talk will be uh, from a more clinical point of view than the one that Mark gave. So without further ado, Jonathan, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joan. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, you're right, it will be a very clinically focused talk. So those of you who are clinicians, hopefully will feel comfortable in this zone, and those of you who aren't, hopefully I'm able to explain things clearly so that it's, uh, the impact of what we're doing is, is clear to you. Now, this is, for those of you who haven't been out to the Austin, our new centre. It's a, an integrated clinical and uh, laboratory facility um, with our inpatient wards, our ambulatory areas and our laboratories all within the one building. So we've designed the place to do translational medicine, which I think for immunotherapy is terribly important because there's a lot that we can learn uh, both in the clinic and in the lab and to be able to bring the two into close uh, approximation is enormously valuable. So this is what we set out to achieve and this is um, what we do achieve and see quite regularly. Uh, this is one of my patients. He's uh, got melanoma. Um, this is a, a CAT scan, and that's a, a large metastasis in the right lobe of his liver. Uh, this is February of last year, and you can see within a few months, uh, this tumour has almost completely disappeared. Um, he's alive and well today, and what made the difference in this man's life was not surgery, not radiation, not chemotherapy. It was the administration of a monoclonal antibody which stimulated his immune system by inhibiting the immune checkpoint CTLA4. And we'll talk a little bit about that antibody and a number of other reagents that are now available for routine clinical use which are resulting in these dramatic effects on cancer and which means that many patients who were once expected to die from their disease are now often able to live their lives uh, without disease at all. Uh, we don't know how durable that benefit is, but certainly in many cases it appears to be long-lasting. 
And as a result, of course, the literature has been ablaze with, uh, with the celebration of these achievements and uh, the covers of Nature and Science and numerous articles in the New England Journal and other leading clinical uh, um, papers um, uh, really uh, highlighting the, the achievements preclinically and, and clinically. Um, I'd like to go right back to the beginning uh, for those of you who are not immunologists and just, um, I guess, provide some background information in terms of how we got to where we are today uh, over many years. So this is a, a kidney and this is a case report that was published in the New England Journal about uh, uh, 15 years ago now, a little less, uh, about a patient who had a renal transplant. So this kidney was implanted into someone who had renal failure from a donor uh, who had, uh, who had, I'm not sure what the circumstances were under which they became a donor, but had donated this kidney. Um, and shortly after the kidney was transplanted, uh, the renal function went off, uh, became clear that the graft was failing, and so it was removed surgically, and when it came out it was black. And it was black because it was infiltrated extensively with melanoma cells and the reason it was infiltrated with melanoma cells became apparent when they went back into the history of the donor and 16 years earlier that donor had had a small thin melanoma removed. Uh, it had been forgotten. Uh, yet clearly melanoma cells had existed within the blood or the kidney of that donor of all of that time without being clinically apparent at all. And something had maintained the control, presumably immune surveillance or some sort of a measure of immune control because when put into the recipient, uh, something happened and that is that in addition to the surgery, uh, the recipient was immunosuppressed and the strong immunosuppressive drugs meant that the, that the controls that the immune system were potentially applying um, were taken off and as a result the kidney um, became colonised with tumour in, in no time at all. If you look at the transplant registry data, so these are patients who received renal transplants uh, over a number of years. This is Australian data. It's actually fairly old data, but nonetheless, it's uh, many thousands of patients. You can see that the risk ratio of developing cancer in patients who receive a transplant and are therefore immunosuppressed doesn't just apply to melanoma. It applies to many different types of cancer as well. Um, the highest... Uh, ratio is for CNS lymphoma. That's probably because it's a very rare disease otherwise. This is an EBV-associated tumour. Um, there are other cancers as well. Um, Kaposi sarcoma is a, uh, a virus-associated cancer. This is associated with HPV, as is this, as is this. So you can see a number of these are virus-associated tumours, uh, but a number of them are not obviously associated uh, with viruses as well. And you can see that the incidence of cancer in these immunosuppressed people is significantly increased across a spectrum of cancer types. So this is not just a melanoma story, it's a story that relates to the immune surveillance and control of cancers across the board. Uh, this is a survival curve. This is uh, what we think about when we're treating patients with melanoma. Melanoma can be staged, stage one, two, three and four. Now, this is early stage disease. Uh, which is usually cured surgically. Um, but you can see that the curve does drop off over time. This is a 15-year scale. And the donor of that kidney would have been a stage 1 or stage 2 patient who, whose disease was not clinically apparent. But you can see for stage 4 disease that um, this is a death sentence uh, in the majority of patients. And within two or three years, the majority are dead. In fact, 50% of patients are dead or used to be dead um, by about seven or eight months. Nonetheless... Despite that, there are some patients with stage 4 melanoma who are alive and well 15 years later. So there's a population here who are clearly behaving very differently to those who die within the first 6 to 12 months of, uh, of the diagnosis being established. And if you look at the tumours of these patients, you'll often find this. So these are tumour infiltrating lymphocytes. In this stain, uh, they're stained for CD8 cells. So the large nuclei are tumour cells, the small brown ones are CD8 cells. And you can see that this particular tumour is riddled with CD8 lymphocytes. And this is a good prognostic factor. If you've got that in your tumour, you're more likely to do well. And it turns out you're more likely to respond well to immunotherapeutics as well. Now, what's going on inside the tumour microenvironment? Well, there's an awful lot going on. Um, there are tumour cells, but in addition to the tumour cells, there's stroma. 
There are myeloid cells. Uh, these may be dendritic cells and maybe macrophages or monocyte lineage cells. Uh, there are lymphocytes of various sorts, um, CD4 and CD8 cells, regulatory cells, natural killer cells. Um, B cells as well can be found. There are cytokines uh, and there's a whole range of regulatory molecules that can enhance and suppress immune activity. And then of course the lymphocytes and dendritic cells will migrate through regional lymphoid tissue where antigen specific responses will be generated and these cells will circulate back into the tumour where they can potentially control the disease. So there's a complex environment which involves the regulation at many levels involving regulatory cells, regulatory cytokines and the dynamics of not just the tumour but also the stroma which interacts as well. And all of these are potential targets for therapeutic intervention. And it goes back a long way. So uh, if you uh, go back to the 1970s, you'll see that people were injecting melanoma cells with BCG. BCG is bacille cum garant. It's a bacillus which is used uh, to vaccinate kids in the developing world against tuberculosis. We don't, uh, we don't vaccinate against TB in the West, but, uh, but um, BCG used to be injected into melanomas and had uh, some impact. Uh, this is Lloyd Old, um, who was the director of the Ludwig Institute for many years with someone called Helen Coley Nortz. And Helen Coley was the daughter of a surgeon called William Coley, who practiced in New York back in the 1880s. And he was the guy who identified um, uh, the therapeutic impact of injecting bacterial toxins into patients. And in a proportion of the patients who he injected with these toxins, so-called Coley's toxins, uh, you could see remissions of cancer. So going back more than a century, it was recognised that bacterial products uh, could stimulate anti-cancer responses. Um, one of those bacterial products was probably um, um, lipopolysaccharide or other uh, uh, other uh, other bacterial um, components which would stimulate cytokine production and one of the earliest cytokines to enter clinical practice was interferon alpha and this is a little bit of data showing that um, many years ago now, um, back in the 90s, um, the administration of interferon alpha had some modest effect on the outcome of patients with melanoma. And uh, Interleukin-2, similarly, um, when administered to patients, could have impact. You can see this survival curve is actually looking pretty good. Um, these are selected patients. So these are patients who received IL-2 and achieved a complete remission. And having achieved a complete remission, that's what their survival looked like. 80% of them, uh, or 60% of them, uh, were long-term survivors. Uh, unfortunately, only a small proportion of patients would achieve a complete remission. But nonetheless, these studies clearly highlight the fact that therapeutic interventions, even crude ones, could have impact on the survival of patients with melanoma. And since then, a range of cytokines have gone into clinical trials and a range of bacterial products, including toll-like receptor agonists, um, uh, have been tried in a variety of ways. And some of them are still used clinically for the treatment of disease. So, for example, um, uh, TLR7 uh, and, uh, agonists um, are, are used to treat some forms of skin cancer. And these cytokines, uh, interferon, um, interleukin-12, GMCSF, FLT3 ligand, are often still used in clinical trials to try to boost immunity. So the other area that, um, that people have worked on over the years are cancer vaccines. And the concept is that there are tumour antigens and if you can stimulate a response against those antigens, just like you can control um, uh, infectious diseases with, with vaccine strategies, you should be able to control cancer the same way, knowing what those antigens are. Um, despite more than 20 years of applying vaccines, the impact has been very modest. I mean, and there's been numerous attempts tried with peptides, with proteins, with gangliosides, with a range of adjuvants, with cytokines, with viruses, with dendritic cells. Um, this prompted a, an editorial um, from Stephen Rosenberg, who was uh, one of the leaders in the cancer immunotherapy fields from the NIH, to say, look, you know, we're seeing 3% response rates in, in all the patients we've ever vaccinated, and this strategy is a waste of time. Here's some data from our own clinical trial, which I'll show you a little bit more of later. This was a randomised trial. You can see there's no separation between the lines. So somehow, for some reason, despite the fact that we can identify the antigens and vaccinate with those antigens, the impact of 
of vaccine strategies has been very, very limited. And the reasons for that, I think, will uh, we'll come to subsequently. Uh, Rosenberg was a great believer in adoptive transfer. And in fact, he has developed numerous protocols over many years in which T lymphocytes were removed from the patients, manipulated ex vivo, reinfused, and those reinfused cells have had impact on cancer. And he, there's some examples from some of his clinical trials here. And there's no doubt that in selected patients, this technology can be highly effective at eradicating cancer and often resulting in long-term clinical benefit. The challenge is that it can be time consuming and it doesn't always work and it's expensive. And of course, you need to be able to extract lymphocytes and grow them up and be able to reinfuse them. And of course, the patient has got to still be alive at the end of the process of being able to derive those cells and expand them. And the time delays that that, that involves can often be sufficient to, uh, to make it not feasible for many, for many patients who are treated. So the area which has really been the game changer in recent times is the identification of the immune checkpoints. Um, so these are regulatory molecules that sit um, on T lymphocytes. Uh, uh, their ligands are expressed on antigen presenting cells. Uh, in some cases, the ligands are also expressed on cancer cells. And it's the interaction between these molecules uh, which can inhibit or regulate immunity and where the ability to interfere with these molecules can have an effect on clinical outcomes for cancer. And you can see two of these have got red boxes around them, CTLA-4 and PD-1. Um, their ligands are uh, B7 and, um, and uh, PD-L1 or PD-L2. And these two have had the most clinical impact in recent times, but they are not the only immune checkpoints which are potential targets for clinical uh, intervention and many others are now being evaluated in the clinic and will follow um, as, as therapeutics, either as monotherapies or in combination. And here are some of them. Um, CTLF-1 and PD-1 here, TIM-3, um, LAG-3, um, and these are inhibitory receptors. And then there's a variety of activating receptors as well, um, OX40, CD28, GITA, and so on. And um, therapeutic antibodies, which are either agonistic antibodies or inhibitory antibodies, are being evaluated in the clinic to, uh, to get the sorts of outcomes that people want, that is the, the, the stimulation of antigen-specific immunity. So to put it in very simple terms, and I uh, apologise if this is an oversimplification, um, CTLA-4 and PD-1 are the first two of these to have really hit the big time clinically. They act at different parts in the cycle. Um, the predominant effect of CTLA-4 uh, is believed to be at the point at which dendritic cells prime uh, immune responses. So when the DC activates T cells, it does through, through co-stimulatory molecules. Um, and that primarily involves the B7 group of molecules interacting with CD28 on the T cell. Um, CTLA-4 is an alternative uh, receptor for B7, and um, if the T cell engages CTLA-4 rather than CD28, you'll get um, an inhibitory uh, uh, effect rather than a co-stimulatory effect. So the use of a, a blocking antibody to interfere with that interaction uh, can push the net effect in the, in the direction of stimulation. Um, PD-1, on the other hand, um, is largely expressed um, by the tumour cell, shown here, uh, where it can ligate, uh, so PDL1 can ligate PD1 on the T lymphocyte and inactivate the T cell within the peripheral tissues. Of course, for that T cell to get to the tumour cell and interact with it, it needs to be an antigen specific cell which recognises an antigen on this T cell. So, this is a lymphocyte uh, which is already has already experienced um, the tumour antigen and uh, through this process then gets uh, uh, suppressed through a tumour-specific interaction. So uh, if we go back to CTLA-4 to just put this in the simplest of terms, um, the T cell receptor is a little bit like a key in the lock. If you don't have a specific interaction, you don't get anything. But once you've got initiation of the process, you need to regulate that. And there are accelerators and brakes. Uh, the B7, CD28 uh, interaction can be seen as an accelerator, which will push uh, the proliferation of T lymphocytes. Um, this interaction with the alternative ligand, uh, CTLA-4, is like putting the brakes on. And if you interfere with this by taking off the brakes, then you get uncontrolled uh, proliferation of the, of the lymphocytes. 
And what's the impact of that? Well, this is a uh, Kaplan-Meier curve. So this is, a clinic, this is clinical data from patients treated on a clinical trial. Um, patients either received chemotherapy or they received um, uh, anti-CTA4, this antibody called ipilimumab. And this is the difference. And you'd have to say it's modest, okay? Um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, instead of about 10% of these patients surviving long-term, you've got about 20% of patients. So a doubling of the long-term survival in this patient population. So an important first step. 80% uh, of these patients are still in serious trouble, but nonetheless, uh, that survival curve is, uh, is pushing north. And this is just the results of a pooling of a large number of phase two and three trials. And you can see this is a pretty consistent finding, about 20% of patients with melanoma who get um, anti-CTLA-4 ipilimumab can be expected to survive long-term. So that's a substantial increase on what was before. So the next uh, molecule to enter clinical uh, uh, practice was anti-PD-1. And there are two anti-PD-1 antibodies out there, one made by Merck called Pembrolizumab and one made by BMS called nivolumab, and they're very similar in terms of their effect. This is a little bit of data taken from one of the first clinical trials with a PD-1 antibody. Each one of these lines is an individual patient. These things are called spider plots, and so you can track the increase in the size of tumour volume um, by looking at these individual lines. And you can see that um, for many of these patients, um, once they started on the clinical trial, the disease did not progress. It either stood still or it shrunk. Uh, in some cases, it grew for a little bit and then shrunk. And in a relatively small number of patients, there was continued growth of the tumour. So if you just look at these uh, data patient by patient, you can see that blocking PD-1 had significant clinical impact on many of the patients in this trial, even if they didn't achieve, achieve a clinical regression of their tumours. And here's an example of, uh, of this, um, here's a liver mass and here's uh, a subcutaneous mass and you can see that there's something interesting happening here. The tumour is actually getting bigger before it gets smaller again. Um, and that's shown on these spider graphs here. So there's a series of patients and uh, they represent a significant chunk of patients who receive immunotherapies where the tumour does eventually respond but initially there is some growth of the tumour before it shrinks. And that's because this is not chemotherapy. The, the effector is not... Um, sorry, the, the drug is not acting on the tumour. The drug is acting on the immune system. And before the drug can have an effect, the immune system has got to be engaged and respond and get to the point where it's capable of, of killing the cancer. And so there's going to be some competing kinetics there, the kinetics of ongoing tumour growth competing with the kinetics of, of the anti-tumour response. And that's sort of reflected in, in this. People often refer to this as pseudoprogression, which I think is probably not a good name. The, the concept is, well, maybe this thing is full of lymphocytes and the reason that it's so big is that it's inflamed. Well, there might be a bit of inflammation in there, but I can't believe that, uh, that that's all explained by, by the thing being a bag full of lymphocytes. Nonetheless, you can see that there's a gratifying response. This thing uh, ultimately disappeared and this liver metastasis as well, you can see, disappears as well. So the other bit of good news about PD-1 inhibitors is that they don't just work in melanoma. So just as when you look at the transplant literature, you can see that immunosuppression is associated with the emergence of cancers of many different types. When you give PD-1 inhibitors to multiple cancer types, you can see responses as well. And you see responses not just in melanoma, but in lung cancer, kidney cancer, bladder, ovarian, head and neck, Hodgkin's, you know, many of the common cancers that we see will now respond to these immunotherapeutics. So this is not just a melanoma story, it's a story which has the potential to transform cancer medicine across the board. And that's terribly important because, you know, you will not find too many patients who say that they enjoy receiving chemotherapy. Even the prospect of receiving chemotherapy distresses someone. If you can say to someone, we don't need to treat you with chemotherapy, we can actually get rid of this using something that boosts the immune system, that comes as a huge relief to, to anyone that you have that conversation with. Okay, so this is a little bit more clinical trial data. This is a randomised clinical trial in which the two agents that I've just spoken about, anti-CTLA-4, ipilimumab, and anti-PD-1, nivolumab, are combined together. And the combination 
which is shown in orange, is compared to monotherapy with anti-PD-1 and monotherapy with anti-CTLA-4. So this is a randomised trial just reported last month. And as you might imagine, here's IPI tracking reliably at about 20%. Uh, here's nivolumab doing pretty well at about 50% and you can see when you add the two together you get a, a, an improved effect. This is progression-free survival, not overall survival. The trial is too young to know what the overall survival of these patients. So progression-free survival means that there's no evidence of clinical progression. So that means that those patients who had that initial early progression and then responded later would are actually technically described as progressors in this. So the, you'd expect that the overall survival would be somewhat better. And this is um, what the data looks like if you do something called a waterfall plot. Um, the waterfall plot basically tracks um, the magnitude of the shrinkage of the tumour um, where each line is an individual patient. And so each of these little orange lines is one patient and you can see that some patients achieved a 100% disappearance, so this is a complete remission. Many patients achieved substantial shrinkage of the tumour and a small proportion of patients had disease progression. So there was still progression in some, but the majority of patients had tumour shrinkage and you can see that that's also the case for each of these as monotherapies, but the, the best result was seen using the combination of the two. And the other thing that was done as part of this study is they looked in the tumour microenvironment to see if PD-L1 was expressed because this should only work if there's PD-L1 expression within the tumour. And interestingly, um, if there was uh, PD-L1 present, the patients who got monotherapy did just as well as the patients who got combination therapy. Um, if PD-L1 was present at low levels, um, far less impact. So the interpretation of this is that and pd one is a highly plastic marker, you can induce it. And the, the interpretation is this, it's quite likely that the anti-CTLA-4 is actually inducing some inflammatory change, which is upping the pd one in the tumour, which means that once you combine the two, in those um, where pd one is positive, um, you know, it doesn't actually make any difference because it's already there, but in, where it's negative, it does make a difference, if that makes sense. Um, this is a busy slide and I don't really mean for you to look at all of these numbers. The important thing is to look at these uh, words down the side here. So these are adverse events. So these are the side effects that patients get when they receive these agents. And uh, um, all of these basically are autoimmune side effects. Okay, so skin rash um, is due to infiltration of the skin with inflammatory cells. Diarrhea and colitis is due to dysregulation of um, the homeostasis of inflammation in the gut. These patients get autoimmune colitis and uh, there's some changes in liver function and endocrine changes as well, all of which are autoimmune diseases. Some strange autoimmune conditions, something called hypophysitis, which is autoimmune inflammation of the pituitary gland. Uh, autoimmune thyroiditis, which is autoimmune, you know, which is the thyroid. And this is uh, autoimmune hepatitis. Patients um, develop inflammatory changes in the liver all of which is quite manageable clinically and certainly nothing like um, the side effects we see with chemotherapy. Okay, so that's pretty much what the state of the art is at present with um, the immunotherapy of cancer with these two agents. So where do we go from here? Is this the end of the story or just the beginning of the story? And clearly I think it's just the beginning, otherwise I wouldn't, wouldn't be having this discussion with you. And to illustrate some of the framework in which I'd like to talk about um, clinical variability. I just want to give you a couple of examples, a couple of little clinical vignettes. Uh, these are patients who've come through our unit who we've studied and have turned out to be really interesting from our point of view. So the first oops, is a patient who's now in her, um, in her 60s, actually, early 60s. When I first met her, was in her mid-40s. She's alive and well, more than 15 years later. And when I first met her, she had this, which is a secondary in her brain. And she had this, which is a secondary in her liver. And she had this, which is a secondary, which is actually a different one from this one. This is in her gallbladder. And this is tumour which was resected from behind her nose, from her postnasal space. And she also had tumour involving her uh, bones and lymph nodes and multiple subcutaneous sites. Um, we 
gave her some radiotherapy. So the first thing we wanted to do was treat this. So she had something called stereotactic radiotherapy, which is where highly focused radiation is administered and, and this little lesion was treated and she had no other, no other treatment at all. And interestingly, all of her disease then melted away. Within the next few months, she had a complete clinical remission. Um, every lymph node melted away, all the tumour that was clinically evident went away. There was still a mass in the gallbladder when we actually went in and removed that surgically. This is what we found. And this brown stuff is melanin in macrophages. So this is, these are melanin-laden macrophages. Macrophages are stuffed with um, the leftovers of melanocytic cells, but no viable tumour at all. Not a single viable cell was found. Some lymphocytes in there as well. Simultaneously with that... Um, episode, she developed some bleeding from the bowel, which we biopsied. And this is a biopsy of her bowel. And you can see it's full of lymphocytes. And this is Crohn's disease. So this is colitis. So the sequence of events was that radiotherapy of this lesion induced a cascade of inflammatory changes which resulted in the development of Crohn's colitis and the complete disappearance of tumour at every site. Okay? Now, we actually collected blood as it happened through the course of this, and it was quite interesting. The regulatory T lymphocytes, which were present at increased numbers, they often are in cancer patients, almost completely disappeared from her circulation during the nadir of this remission and then returned to normal sometime later. So all of this was associated with some changes in regulatory mechanisms that we could measure by looking at lymphocyte numbers, T-reg uh, numbers. Um, but this is a very rare event, as you'd appreciate, and presumably there's something going on in her which reflects a genetic predisposition to autoimmunity and, interestingly, to, uh, to cancer remission. And it's sort of really interesting because colitis is one of the well-recognised side effects of anti-CTLA-4. So we're having a look at her, at her genome now to see if we can find the genetic basis for this because she may have inherited a, um, well, you could call it a, uh, an autoimmune predisposition gene on the one hand or alternatively you could call it a cancer protection gene on the other. Here's another patient. Um, this is a guy with melanoma. This is a PET scan, so this is uptake by fluorodeoxyglucose in the tumour. That's his bladder, um, but that's his brain. But the rest of this are deposits of cancer. There's a big nodal mass in his groin. There's stuff on his arm, face and neck, you know, horrible disease. And we um, had previously treated him with an anti-PD-1 agent. It didn't get better. And we put him on a clinical trial with, um, with anti-CTLA-4. And this is what happened. Um, his colon is lighting up. This guy had profound colitis, watery diarrhoea every hour or so, uh, admitted to the hospital, severe dehydration, almost died from overwhelming colitis. And you can see the tumour, if anything, looks worse. And in fact, uh, we fixed his colitis. You can see it's getting better there. But, um, but his tumour wasn't touched by the immunotherapeutic. So here are two patients, one who just needed a little bit of whiff of radiation and got better, got some colitis along the way, and here's someone else who got profound colitis and the tumour wasn't touched. So very different ends of the spectrum, united, I guess, by the, the common feature of having melanoma and colitis. But why is it so? Why is there such a profound difference in the outcomes in these two patients? And that leads us to the thinking that as we treat patients with immunotherapeutics, we need to understand them better. We need to understand their disease better. We need to understand their immunity better. We need to understand their genetic predispositions better. How do we personalise immunotherapy? Just as we talk about personalising cancer therapeutics with targeted agents. You know, if you want to hit something with a BRAF inhibitor, you need to identify a BRAF mutation. Got an EGFR mutation, go in with an EGFR. You know, that's personalisation of targeted therapy. How do you start to think about personalising immunotherapy. And here are some of the things that we need to think about, things in the tumour, things in the host. Um, and I'll touch on some of these now in the last uh, 15 or so minutes of the talk. So the tumour microenvironment. So the first thing is that um, we've seen this before. Uh, if you've got T lymphocytes within your tumour microenvironment, you're more likely to do well without treatment and you're more likely to respond 
to um, an immunotherapeutic, and in particular a PD-1-based therapy. And this has been known for years and years. This is some data from the 90s looking at T lymphocytes in primary melanomas, showing that if your primary tumour, when the pathologist looks at the melanoma that comes off your skin, sees lymphocytes, you'll do a whole lot better than if he doesn't see lymphocytes. Tony Rebus, who's a colleague of ours at UCLA, has gone into tumours and looked at a, a, an immune gene signature and identified a whole lot of genes that are associated with better outcomes. Here's some survival data down here to show that. Um, he used the nanostring platform, so he looked at a whole panel of inflammatory markers, but in fact narrowed it down to, to 20 or so. Um, and interestingly, all of these uh, markers are associated with gamma interferon within the tumour microenvironment. So um, if there's gamma um, and gamma-induced molecules, um, you're far, far more likely to do better. And he and others have now identified this so-called grumbling inflammation within the tumour as being a very important prerequisite for a response to an immune checkpoint inhibitor, in particular PD-1 inhibitor. However, you can see from his you know, initial uh, test set here that, um, that so these are the non-responders and these are the responders. So you know the responders are those with a with an immune score, and the non-responders tended not to have the score. But you know here's someone who had a score but no response. So um, necessary but not sufficient to have one of these immune signatures within your tumour. So if you've got inflammation within the tumour as a prerequisite for an immune response, what is it that the immune response is responding to? And clearly it must be responding to antigens. Um, and so what are the antigens? And can we get some clinical benefit by better understanding these antigens? With a caveat being, as I mentioned earlier, that vaccines have proven themselves not to be particularly effective. So when you think of melanoma, and this uh, varies um, from tumour to tumour, but in melanoma there's a variety of different ones. So there are unique antigens. There are mutations. The mutations result in gene products which are uh, abnormal. Those abnormal gene products um, will be different from patient to patient depending on what the mutational profile of the tumour is. There are differentiation antigens. In melanoma, the immune system can recognise some of these molecules associated with melanocytic differentiation. These are um, associated with the autoimmune disease vitiligo, where people lose pigmentation of the skin. So it's an autoimmune condition. And similarly, um, these can be tumour rejection antigens in melanoma. There's a group of molecules called cancer germline or cancer testis antigens, which I'll come to in a little while. These are molecules which are epigenetically regulated and as a result of epigenetic changes within the tumour, you can get um, expression of these molecules as a cancer-specific phenomenon. So these things will not be expressed in normal tissues. Uh, they will only be seen in the tumour and as a result of that, uh, can be considered to be neoantigens from an immunological point of view. And then there are some other molecules, such as cell surface molecules that are recognised by antibodies, and they include some carbohydrates and glycolipids. So let's just talk a little bit about um, neoantigens and mutational frequency. So this is a little bit of data, again, just published uh, uh, the end of May uh, in the New England Journal um, from patients who have got a uh, a group of tumours known as uh, tumours with mismatch repair deficits. And some of you may be familiar with what that means. So in colorectal cancer, it's associated with DNA repair abnormalities. And as a result, you can get um, increased genomic instability within those tumours and, um, and presumably uh, many more neoantigens are produced. If you look at these tumours down the microscope, they often have, or almost uniformly have, increased inflammatory changes, so increased numbers of lymphocytes within the tumour. Now, mismatch repair deficits aren't only seen in colorectal cancer. They're also seen in other tumour types as well. And that includes some uh, gynaecological malignancies, for example, and some upper GI malignancies. So in this study, what they did is they had a look at the responses of patients who had mismatch repair tumours to see if they were more likely to respond to an immunotherapy than if they didn't. And that's what's shown here. So in blue, uh, colorectal cancer. In black, non-colorectal cancer, but nonetheless with mismatch repair gene deficit. And in brown, mismatch repair um, 
proficient, so no abnormality, colorectal cancer. And you can see this has changed from baseline. The responses are nearly all seen in the patients who had mismatch repair abnormalities with a couple of exceptions. So there were some patients who had abnormalities but didn't respond. Nonetheless, um, there were virtually no substantial responses in the patients who had um, normal mismatch repair uh, proficient cancers. This is TCGA data. So each one of these uh, columns is a different cancer type. Um, here's melanoma, here's lung cancer, there's some bowel cancer over here, colorectal. And you can see this is the number of somatic mutations or the frequency of somatic mutations in the tumours. And for these, melanoma, lung cancer, some colorectal cancer, you can see lots of mutations. And so the assumption is that the majority of the patients who respond are those who've got... Um, high numbers of mutations as a result, neoantigens. And if you wanted to put a number on that, you know, anything above this line probably falls into that. So that's perhaps a third of human cancers. So there's still going to be two-thirds of human cancers if this is the sole basis for response, which are not going to benefit from these therapies unless other antigens can be recognised. Um, this is a little bit of data in melanoma from Jed Walchok's group, um, basically saying the same things. You can look at mutational frequency and look to see if there's long-term benefit from therapy or not, and you can see that the patients somewhat segregate uh, on that basis, and there's a survival curve. And in fact, if you do the analysis at a more sophisticated level, where well, you don't only... And this was... They did some next-gen sequencing, so what they did is they basically characterised uh, the entire... Uh, exomes of these patients, um, looked at the uh, proposed translated products, identified putative antigens and then put those antigens into a computer algorithm to s ask whether or not there were epitopes which could be recognised by immunity. And if you did that, you see, in fact, there's a very strong uh, relationship between uh, epitope generation and, uh, and clinical benefit. Okay, so what about the two-thirds of patients who don't have these high mutation frequencies? And the, the group of molecules that we've been interested in, these so-called cancer testis antigens, because they're seen whether you've got high mutational frequencies or not, and they're epigenetically regulated, so if you've got some changes within the tumour that result in their expression, they're available, and some of them are very immunogenic. Um, I won't go into them in a great deal of detail, but this is just a heat map to show... Um, to show these, so these are the names of many of these molecules. You can see there's about 100 of them here. And this shows the pattern of tissue distribution. So there's a range of normal tissues listed across here. And in this column, some cancers. And if you um, expand that up, you can see, in fact, that um, uh, the cancer types aren't shown. But for, for many of these, in fact, expression is quite commonly seen in a variety of, of human cancers. So these are neoantigens in, in, in many human cancers. And interestingly, it's pretty clear uh, that in some patients, spontaneous immune recognition of these antigens does take place. Um, so let's just take this as an example. This is a little bit of selective data from a single patient. Um, this is a survival curve. This is someone down here on that part of the survival curve, you know, a long-term survivor. If you take the serum from that patient and do a seromic profile, so you basically put it on a chip which has been had multiple proteins arrayed. Um, so these are some of the proteins that were arrayed on this chip, all of which were cancer testis antigens. Um, you can see that um, each one of these spikes above 1,000 is a hit. You can see that for a number of these molecules, there's, in fact, antibody reactivity. So this patient didn't have any treatment, OK? It's a spontaneous recognition of an epigenetically regulated tumour antigen. And presumably... Um, this response was not productive because the patient still had cancer, but nonetheless the cancer patient was a long-term survivor, so there might have been some sort of immune homeostasis going on in, in, in a patient like this, and, and clear evidence that these antigens were, were recognised by the cancer. And um, I'll skip over this, but this basically just shows that these antigens are plastic as well. They come and go. Um, if the tumour progresses, you can see upregulation up of some of these molecules. Um, all right, so I'm going to skip through this very quickly. So we've been interested in one of these, something called NYSO1, which has been um, something we've turned into a vaccine. And if you inject this vaccine, you can see um, 
uh, immune responses. Uh, each one of these bars is a is a either CD8 T cell response against an epitope, or a CD4 response against an epitope. This is the 180 amino acid sequence of the protein, and you can see in this individual patient lots of responses to lots of epitopes, both CD4 and CD8. Um, so um, this is an immunogenic protein. It generates T cells, generates four, uh, CD4 cells, generates CD8 cells. Actually, generates antibodies as well. And we did a vaccine with this. Um, this just shows that we got antibody responses. Uh, we got nice T cell responses to the vaccine. And we went on to do a, a randomised clinical trial. Um, monitored the trial, showed lots of you know immunity, lots of immunity, lots of immunity, but no clinical benefit, okay? The, the survival of the control patient population was identical to the survival of the, of the vaccinated population. So there's recognition of the antigen, but no clinical benefit. And of course, the question is, is immunity being regulated here? Are there these regulatory mechanisms which involve immune checkpoints at play, which is preventing this immunity, which we know is there, from actually having any impact on the cancer? Um, but there's other possibilities as well. So here's one of the patients who was on the trial, and you can see this tumour, which has got in way so one in it, it's full of orange cells, so that's antigen, and lots of lymphocytes, so nice brisk immune response. When she relapsed, antigen's still there, but the T cells have all gone, okay? So the immune response has completely disappeared. And in fact, if you go into this tumour and have a look at it, this is um, HLA class one, um, you can see the stroma and the surrounding tissue is class 1 positive, but the tumour has completely lost class 1. So this tumour can't be seen by the immune system because the tumour has evolved. It's lost class 1 and the antigen, even though it's still there, can no longer be seen. Here's another example. Here's a patient, again, NYSO1. Um, on relapse, uh, no NYSO1, so the antigen's lost, okay? So there's this suggestion that um, there are multiple mechanisms which could be at play. There may be regulation on the one hand. On the other hand, there might be something called immune editing where the tumour um, phenotype is altered as a result of ex exposure to the... To the um, and others have, um, have published recently, this is uh, from Tom Gajewski's group, um, the observation that even if the antigens are the same, uh, you can see differences in, um, in tumour outcomes um, associated with a beta-catenin gene signature. Uh, so if there's evidence of activation of beta-catenin within the tumour, um, in his hands he can uh, demonstrate that that's associated with exclusion of lymphocytes from the tumour microenvironment. So an oncogenic mechanism probably at play there, which is, uh, which is excluding lymphocytes. So the picture is emerging that we have, because um, of course cancer, you know, has a time course in some of these patients over years, that there's perhaps evolution to consider as well. The evolution of the tumour, which can change, the evolution of the immune response, which will adapt in parallel with the tumour. So these two uh, can co-evolve. And in fact, this is described uh, by Bob Schreiber and his group um, about a decade ago, a little more, um, as the three E's, um, immunoediting. Um, initially, you get elimination. If the immune system is effective, it can eradicate the tumour. If it doesn't eradicate the tumour, at least you can get some sort of equilibrium. And presumably that kidney transplant donor was in a state of equilibrium. And then when the circumstances are, are ripe, um, either because the tumour has evolved or the immune system has been suppressed or something else happens, um, you can get escape and the tumour then can emerge and you've got um, evident cancer. And, you know, Mac Burnett proposed, you know, in the 60s that, um, that immunosurveillance was eradicating little tumours. And I don't know how many of us have had little malignant clones uh, eradicated on an ongoing basis, but presumably the transplantation literature gives us a sense of the extent to which that's actually happening. So this sort of gives rise to this um, concept, and I'll finish off on this, of, uh, as perhaps we want to start thinking about immunotherapy in terms of personalising it. Um, the tumour evolves, it elim it's el eliminated, there's this equilibrium and ultimately escape. We want to intervene with therapy perhaps out here. Um, there are going to be some host factors. I haven't talked about that, but my patient with the Crohn's disease, I think, needs to be thought of in terms of genetic predisposition or otherwise. 
Um, the microbiome almost certainly plays a critical role in terms of establishing the inflammatory milieu in which all of this uh, occurs, and there'll be metabolic and other environmental factors as well. And then mechanisms like PD-1 will come into play which will regulate immunity. And if regulation is the thing which is preventing that patient from rejecting the cancer, then we have strategies. We have immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, other molecules, you know, that we can target therapeutically which deal with regulatory mechanisms. And we want to be able to interrogate the tumour, identify what regulatory mechanisms are at play and then target those. There may be other mechanisms such as exclusion of T-cells from the tumour microenvironment such as beta-catenin activation. And if that's the case, then there'll be other strategies we may need to adopt in order to overcome those barriers to T-cell entry. And radiation, for example, is a mechanism that can be used. Um, oncolytic viruses could potentially alter the microenvironment and change the inflammatory milieu. And then uh, there may be immune ignorance. The immune system may have never actually seen the tumour antigen. It's unlikely, I think, late in the course of the disease, or alternatively editing, in which case the immune system is now no longer able to, to see the antigens that are there. And if that's the case, we need to adopt strategies which enable either the antigens or new antigens to be revealed, and that can be done perhaps by um, manipulating the epigenome, or alternatively by introducing effectors, adoptive transfer of lymphocytes that can recognise antigens. So I think it's a complex picture, but nonetheless, if we have the right tools for being able to understand what's going on in the host, understand what's going on in the tumour, understand what's going on at an immune level, uh, we potentially have the ability to personalise immunotherapy just as we have the ability to personalise targeted therapies as well. So I th that's sort of summarised there, and I'll just acknowledge many people at our centre, and uh, thank you and throw it open to questions. some evidence that there was selection against them in some circumstances, but perhaps not as much as you might suspect there would be. Um, is there anything known about the function of the neoantigens? And if they're providing some essential uh, growth characteristic to the tumour that prevents them being lost or downregulated? Yeah, so um, I think uh, there are a lot of work being done to characterise. So that basically, you know, people are using next-gen sequencing platforms and a lot of the antigens that have been identified don't appear to be associated with proteins that are critical for structure. Um, but I think it's probably fair to say that it's, it's, it's pretty early in the piece. Um, nonetheless, um, the, the clinical proof of the putting in a sense is in the eating, right? I mean, you know, in those patients, like the MSI high colorectal cancers or other tumours that have got high... Uh, burdens of mutations, the PD-1-based therapies are highly effective. Uh, so, you know, the treatment is working. Um, exactly um, what the antigens are doesn't appear to be the critical thing. The critical thing appears to be that there are lots of targets there for immune recognition and rejection. Um, I think that's all we can say about it at, at this point. Yeah. Um, in addition to the personal situations of all the patients, in those that respond better to checkpoint inhibitors and those that don't, is there any relationship of age and, and maybe the vitality of the immune system in an older yeah. versus a younger person? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think we are seeing increasingly that, uh, that uh, cancer is a disease of old age, and I think that immune senescence is probably an important underpinning of that, but of course, Genomic, um, you know, the, the cells which yield the cancers are also getting a bit, you know, old and fragile and <laughs> crappy as well, right? So if you look in melanoma, um, the ones with the highest mutational burden tend to be Australian-type skin cancers arising on old white guys, you know, who've got sun-damaged skin, scalp, face, you know, lots of UV damage, lots of mutations, um, they tend to be the ones that respond. Um, so we do see good responses in the elderly. So being old doesn't prevent the checkpoint inhibitors from working. Uh, 
being old in some circumstances is associated with tumours that have got much more um, genomic instability, perhaps. So in those instances, or UV damage, in, in those instances we are seeing high response rates. Um, and um, the oldest responder to one of these agents that I've heard about was someone in their 90s who got a PD-1 inhibitor and actually had a good response. So um, age doesn't appear to preclude responses. Can I read it? And then can I read the some of those patients where you saw tumour growth and then you saw tumour shrinkage, you mentioned that it was thought maybe it was immune cell infiltration that was accounting for some of that inflammation <coughs> that maybe might not be the only, only cause. Do you have any thoughts on what other causes might be happening? Yeah, so some people have biopsied these things and there's no doubt that you can see emphasis in some of them, uh, especially those that go to respond, you know, they're there. But um, I think you just have to think of it as the... the kinetics of two processes which are, in a sense, competing with each other. On the one hand, you've got lymphocytes that are going in and trying to kill the cells. On the other hand, you've got tumour cells which are proliferating and growing. And if you've got a highly proliferative tumour, um, it may never come under control just because of the biology of the disease, uh, unless the immune response is particularly, <coughs> particularly vigorous. Uh, so, um, so people call it pseudo-progression. I think it's real progression. In many cases, uh, and if and when it comes under control, it's it, it's because the kinetics of the immune response was such that they're able to, to to get it back in the box. But in the case of that particular example, is there a temptation, you know, when that melanoma is you know standing out like a big lump to remove it surgically? Yep. So that's right, and you can do that. But of course, if it's in the liver or the brain or the lung or somewhere else, it's less practical. Um, but we still do that. Sometimes what happens is that you'll see metastases shrinking, except one doesn't, you know, and so the surgeon will then go in and remove the, the site of resistant disease. And, um, so there's often heterogeneity in terms of the response, or there can be, and sometimes surgery is the best way of dealing with that last focus of residual disease. I guess following up on this, do you think there would be an interest in uh, doing some combination of the immune checkpoint inhibitors with targeted therapy? So could you speak up, sir? Uh, could you, do you think there will be any interest in combining the immune checkpoint inhibitors with uh, targeted, targeted therapy? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And there are clinical trials being done now. So in melanoma, for example, it's quite interesting. If you give someone a BRAF inhibitor and do a biopsy, you know, two weeks after you start a BRAF inhibitor, you'll see lymphocytes in the tumour, inflammatory changes. And there's probably two explanations for that. One is that um, when you take off oncogenic BRAF signalling, um, that probably changes some immunosuppressive stuff that's going on within the tumour microenvironment. And secondly, activated lymphocytes um, can be paradoxically activated. So if you inhibit BRAF, you can get paradoxical activation of that kind of signalling. So you can actually see lymphocyte activity increasing in the presence of a BRAF inhibitor. So targeted therapy, which is aimed at controlling the tumour, um, is probably immunostimulatory. And there are trials under you know, and being, being done now, which uh, involve BRAF inhibitors plus immune checkpoint inhibitors. And, and there'll be a, a number of variations on that theme. Ultimately, what people want to do is, you know, do the best they can for the patient. So if, you know, if there are strategies which are going to increase the likelihood of benefit, sooner or later they're going to be, going to be tried. But with the immune checkpoint inhibitors now being on the PBS, does that mean every melanoma patient um, yeah, so where possible we put them on a clinical trial because um, the reality is that these are the first very encouraging steps, but this field is just a few years old and there's going to be a lot more progress that can still be made, but it'll only happen if we do trials. So we put patients on trials if we can. Um, if they're not eligible for a trial, they'll generally get a checkpoint inhibitor first. Um, there are some idiosyncrasies with the PBS which say that if you've got a BRAF inhibitor, you have to, the government will only fund, B, you have to have failed a BRAF inhibitor if you can get, but that's where, you know, it's a fight with the PBS. Any more questions? All right, just remains for me to thank Jonathan for a great